Well, she told me not to scare you by telling you all the things I'm in because it would scare you right off from doing anything. Uh, I started out when we first joined, my husband here joined, and uh, I thought he was crazy, and I really didn't believe much in it, but uh, pretty soon people started calling me and say, would you call seven farmers and tell them what the price of beef is or would they ship a cow or something? And just out of courtesy, I started making phone calls. And uh, one thing led to another, and then they, there's feedback on this or something? Yeah, it's not good. And I don't, you're both. Is this better if I stand way back? Okay, let's try it that way. Um, I can speak loud enough. If you're on 11 kids, I can almost go without the mic. <clears throat> but anyways, uh, we progressed from that part to the point where uh, they started saying, you know, will you sell tickets to this and will you get donations for that? And, uh, I, you know, I got suckered right into that too. I hate to use that expression, but my heart wasn't really that much in it. I was really doing it out of courtesy. And I think probably we'd been members for a few years when we went, attended our first state meeting in New York and Erhard Finkston spoke. And I sat there just absolutely dumbfounded with my mouth wide open. I had just never heard anything like that in my life. And it was, you know, like being a born again Christian or something. I thought, my God, is that what's really going on in agriculture? I, you know, the old statistics that a farmer's dollar turns over seven and and, uh, and earned income and all this stuff. Why, you know, I was jotting down notes and I drinking it right in, and I really got fired up. <laughs> and uh, back, my husband had to almost sit on me for a while. He then he thought I was crazy. You know, I thought he was crazy when he joined. But um, we started going to meetings real regular, and wasn't long. Uh, well, my last ba my baby is nine. Was nine the other day, and uh, he was about a year old which would make it eight years ago this January, when uh, he pulled a cup of hot soup over on himself and burned himself a little bit. And I didn't go to county meeting. It was an election meeting in January. And my husband come home late at night. He says, guess who's the new county secretary, you know? And that's how it started. And I just got progressed from that uh, on to publicity director. And of course, NFO was a real bad word in our area, and I guess probably was in a lot of other areas. Uh, I had to overcome an awful lot, and I started doing it very gradually, sending news releases, calling and talking to people. It took me maybe three years anyways before I got the news media so that they would call me, and I was almost getting tired of it after a while, but now whenever an agricultural problem comes up or there's something in the news about agriculture, it's nothing for, you know, a half a dozen uh, radio or TV stations or newspapers to call me or interview me on television or on the radio, and um, it's made it easy now. We don't, I don't even have to work at it now. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, things progressed from that till they finally appointed me or elected me state uh, publicity director and then later state secretary treasurer. And uh, finally, three years ago, I was elected national director, which, you know, was a first for women's lib, you know. We'd been, my husband always uh, was a woman's liber. He let me milk all the cows I wanted to milk. <laughs> yeah, farmer's lib. He let me milk all the cows I wanted to milk. I had all the babies I could possibly have, you know. And uh, he never stopped me. I could bail the hay. I could do anything I wanted to do, you know. And I, I got to tell you this, you know, we've been farmers and we, 19 years we never left the farm and went out at night or took a trip or anything like this. I mean, we just didn't have time. We got 120 cows to milk and all these kids. So finally, you know, our daughter got onto college, our oldest girl at University of Rochester and had parents weekend and we did. 19 years we finally went away one weekend. Well, shortly after that, we were invited to, to a meeting in uh, Canandaigua near Rochester. And these farmers said, come in early, we're going to take you to dinner, you know, a real swanky restaurant, and the maitre d' meets you with a napkin over the arm and everything, you know. And uh, we just never went to those kind of places. And uh, he led us down the aisle, and for some reason my husband was walking ahead of me, and the two other farmers behind me, and we got to the table, and he pulled the chair out for me. The maitre d' pulled the chair out, expecting the lady to sit it, and my husband sat in it. <laughs> <laughs> now he won't get mad about that joke because he really, he really thought it was funny. I said, "Honey, that was for me." He says, "You can pull your own out," you know. <laughs> but 
But, you know, this is what us farm wives have really had to contend with. <laughs> but anyways, um, the farmers, you know, really and truly wanted me to be their national director. I won fair and square the first time, and then I got a little involved in politics, ran for Congress, and kind of slowed down for a year there, and we'd elected another man for two years. And this year, they've really been after me again. We've, my husband and I have been very active signing up new members. The two of us alone have signed up, I think, well over 200 new members in a matter of a couple of months there around springtime, and we're still a few right along all the time now. And as a result of some of the counties we got chartered or going again, um, I would dare say probably another hundred or two have been signed in the area after we left it. So um, the farmers, I guess, thought that I really earned getting back on the board again. And uh, they wanted me, a lot of them said, you know, run again. So I ran against two men and I got more votes than the two men put together on the first ballot. So I think they really wanted me. And um, it's a big sacrifice. Now I gotta tell you right now, um, it's a hard thing to do, and I wouldn't encourage any of you to do as much as I've done, unless you start at a graduate, it's like having kids. I came from a small family. I didn't know what it was to wash dishes for more than, you know, there was only three of us kids, and my older sister got married when I was like 13, so I usually did dishes for four people. And uh, you've all of a sudden you're doing them for like 12 or 16 with between the hired kids and the neighbors and everybody who's in the house. and. Uh, you know, it's a good thing you gradually started with one, two, three, four kids, you know, to work up to it. And it's the same way with getting involved yourself. Um, there are times when I have felt like I've just got to quit all of this, I can't carry it on, and then all of a sudden some farmer will call me or I'll get a letter from somebody and say, you know, really, would you come and see us or uh, would you explain the program to us or set up a meeting? And uh, you get, you know, just like the old horse back in the going again with the oats in front of them and you start right over again. Um, I, in the process of the last, well, let's see, we attended our first convention, Convention 72, which, you know, was really a wild show. <laughs> and it scared me almost, our very first confession, uh, con confession, convention and all the demonstrations going on and fights and everything. But we came home from that convention and in January 73, I started up a little two-county newspaper and my husband named it the Farmer's Freedom Press. He thought that was a good title. And uh, it went along two counties for about two months, and all of a sudden at state meetings people say, well, why don't you send it into ours and send it into ours, and it mushroomed into, like it goes to 5,200 farmers now, where I used to address it by hand and you know, do almost everything by hand. It's now an eight-page newspaper, like the size, I wish I brought some with me, but I forgot them. Uh, the signs of, like of the New York Daily News, that size paper, eight pages long, and I know many of you here get it. Uh, lady here in the front row just gave me $2 to pay for the postage on it. But um, it has been probably the most instrumental factor in our area in signing up farmers. Now, my husband goes out quite a bit, a few afternoons a week signing up farmers, uh, or we hold meetings together. And whenever he gets into an area where there aren't farmers receiving the Freedom Press. You know, it's like going into Siberia as far as getting it through their heads, what collective bargaining is or why we should be organized. But if he goes into an area where they're getting the newspaper and you have to go through very devious means to even get a mailing list of all farmers. Uh, we got one county, we got all the farmers in one county through a very friendly veterinarian who had a list of all the beef animals or or uh, milk animals in the county, which, you know, I don't know if it was kosher or not, but we got it. And I got a list from another county by uh, semi-blackmailing the man who was county executive because my brother got him elected. And I said, you know, you, he helped you, now you help me. But it's really very hard. Uh, Extension won't give you a list, and it's kind of hard to get a list of all farmers. And it's not much use of sending it just to the members because you have got to... I don't want to use the word brainwash, uh, enlighten, we'll use it that way, enlighten these non-members. And uh, the only problem I have with my husband, uh, and uh, it's, it's a big problem for a man to follow this act, you know, um, that when he goes someplace and he'll say, I'm Ed Maxwell, you know, from Newport, and I'm uh, out for NFO, and they'll say, oh, you're Anita's husband, you know. 
And that really, it's kind of hard. You've got to have a big-hearted husband to take something like that. Occasionally it gets to him, and he'll come home real mad. Yeah, they rolled out the red carpet because I was Anita's husband, you know. <laughs> but um, it's, it's something we've learned to work with and live with, and he's been real gracious about it. Uh, he tries not to let it get the best of him. But uh, this has tr helped us tremendously, this little newspaper. I've got to say it has been by far the most important factor that when you go to a farm and he's already getting it, and sometimes I wonder why they don't have the brains or the guts to call you up and say, well, come on, I'll join, stop down and sign me up. Although I must say we've had many, many do this, but still in all you'll get to some and they'll say, oh, you know, yeah, we believe in what you're doing, you're on the right track, and, and it's very easy to sign them. Um, I think we set a first this year. I don't know if Doris knows any more that have done something like this, but I have signed probably, I haven't kept track, maybe between 20 and 30 members by mail that I never even saw, and all of a sudden I show up for a meeting and find out I can remember the names and I connect them with a new face. But uh, people who have written to me and said, you know, we get the newspaper, we're interested in joining, and they lived such a distance away that I just didn't have time to go, and I sent them everything. I, I had to end up buying, you know, those big manila envelopes and I'd put a self-addressed manila envelope in there, even with the stamps on, send them all the material. I've signed up millions of pounds of milk production that way. I <laughs> signed the milk sales, filled out the milk sales agreement form. They'd call me or write to me, and I'd get the information over the phone or through the mail and fill out everything and put it in an envelope, mail it to them, and I'd get it back, I'll tell you, within a few days. Now, we held meetings uh, when there's, this is what I've got to speak about the dairy meeting after this. There's been a you know, a big crisis in the Northeast where last winter 900 farmers lost their milk markets. They were independent farmers and they were being driven into the co-op system to help pay off the bills of the bankrupt co-ops. So farmers would call us, you know, we've lost our market. One county in particular, 106 I think it was in Cayuga County near the Finger Lakes lost their market. Well by the time they called us and we got a meeting set up, they had, most of them already joined the co-ops or sold out. But we held a meeting in a room like this, and it was packed. And uh, we couldn't even offer them a milk market. It was too late. But the Stick Emerson who sells milk for NFO and my husband and I, you know, we each got up and talked to them and explained to them why they should be organized and why they should prevent this from happening again. And at the end of the meeting, now this was the first time I had ever conducted anything like this. At the end of the meeting, uh, Dick and my husband looked at me, and they said, you know, where do we go from here? And I said, well... I said, I'm going to try something, you know, and I, you know, and I felt just like the, the barker at the circus. I hate to use these terms, but that's what you feel like if you start putting on two meetings a day, three, four days a week. But I said, all right, now you've heard what we've got to offer, and you know you've got to be organized, so step right up here and join, you know. And the first one, just like that, this very pregnant little girl waddled right up, you know, she's about 20 years old. She had her check all made out. She filled out the membership agreements with her name and her husband's on. In fact, we had a house meeting down there the other day. They're getting ready to move their milk, and he milks, what, 200 cows? Something around 200 cows. He makes like, well, well over 2 million pounds of milk a year. I just can't remember what it was, but um, she started the ball rolling, and we signed 17 at that meeting, and there were only a few who didn't pay that didn't have the money. And, you know, I really thought, boy, you know, that was really success. I'd never done anything like that before. So we started holding them in surrounding areas as these, the hatchet kept falling more and more. We're losing their markets. And this is where we've got, well, we went into Cortland County that had like two or three members who were signed 14 years ago and never saw another NFO person again, never paid any dues. We held a meeting there on a Tuesday noon <coughs> and, a, and on a, Tuesday, a Thursday night and a following Tuesday, and by that time we had 50 paid-up members and active. I tell you, those people, when we chartered that county, they fought for those jobs like they paid $10,000 a year. They campaigned and quarreled and fought, and the only problem we had was one lady who didn't get elected to a position, and she went home really in a huff. But they wanted, they, why the... We were putting that milk on the truck, and one of the gals, she wasn't even a legitimate farmer. She had a little hay and a couple of horses, but she got wound right up in it because all her neighbors were, and she paid $75 in joint, and she has done more legwork in Cortland County 
she's doing just like what I do. She rode on the bulk tank truck. She went with the milk inspector. She took pictures for me. And the very first meeting we had when we were trying to plot where the milk was and make a good milk run, she had the Cortland County map and she had everybody pinpointed right on there and where their milk was and how much. And you know, they were a tremendous help to me. We didn't, we didn't have much help from home office because they thought I was crazy with what I was doing. I remember calling Don Burke on between meetings. Well, I just signed 11 and we're on to the next meeting. You know, we think we'll get another 15 or 20. And it would happen so fast and we had to move the milk so fast that I borrowed a milk inspector from the western part of the state and uh, this Pat McConnell went out with him and then I, that we had um, truckers show up at all our meetings that really wanted to truck our milk and um, I put Dick Emerson in touch with the truckers to decide how much to pay them and really in a matter of a week we signed up those people, I had them inspected, I had the trucker hired and their milk was moving and they took considerable price under blend but it's built up now to the point, now they have a USPH rating and they're right, they're almost competitive with the market. I think within a month or two they will be. And they have made, you know, I really felt like the godmother. This was the first time I had ever chartered a county on our own like this. We had never been involved in chartering one. But um, it just goes to show you what involvement can do. And you know, if you had told me 10 years ago that I was going to do radio shows or TV shows. Now I've got our TV station in Utica, the biggest one, Channel 2. I have them uh, to the point where they call me about once a month and they say, well, we want a farm report done on Sunday night and Monday, we'll play it again Monday morning. Would you come in and do it? And they don't uh, um, edit what I say and it's all hardcore NFO, you know. <laughs> they don't. And it's free. Now, you know, you know what it would cost to put... Uh, two or three or five minutes on prime television channel on the six o'clock news or 8.30 in the morning and it's free and they have given it to us like that. If you had told me, you know, I was going to do this, I probably would have quit right at the beginning. I mean, I would have been overwhelmed. But um, I gradually worked into it and it has come on me naturally. Editing a newspaper, you know, I have never I had just never done anything in my life but write compositions in school and I graduated from high school when I was 16 and got married a few months later when I barely was 17 and I had no education at all. And I started, you know, with kind of a, well, an amateur looking little newspaper at the beginning and it, within a year or two it really looks pretty professional, doesn't it now? It's a pretty professional looking paper and uh, it's something that I felt we had to do and I mean, I just know that you're sitting here and you're saying I can't go out and collect dues and I can't do this. But let me tell you, you gals have got the greatest advantage. My husband gets so mad, he broke his leg this fall and he couldn't do anything for about a week while he was really swollen. But after that, he did get out on crutches and go out collecting dues. But I said to him, it was a whole rainy week. I said, you know, ride along in the car. I'll drive and I want, I'll collect some dues this week. And we went out two afternoons. First afternoon, five out of five. Second afternoon, five out of five. Third afternoon, we only came home with about two in cash, but three or four that pledged to sell, send cows and have dues deducted, and they did send them. And, you know, he was really get, getting angry. He said, boy, you women really got an advantage. He says, what man's going to admit to a woman he hasn't got $75, you know? <laughs> no matter what he wants to use it for, he's not going to admit to you he hasn't got $75. And some of them, one man I know, they said, don't go near him. He's, you know, he's hopeless. And he was building stanchions in the barn and it was pouring. I drove up to the barn door and run in. And I said, um, Alan, I'm here. We're collecting dues for NFO. You know, we need the money. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. I know I should have sent him. You're working so hard and you wait right here and I'll run to the house and get my checkbook. And he's sitting in the car watching him, you know, and he says, you know, I won't even tell you what he said, but he says, I'd gone in there, I'd got booted out, you know. He came back, he made me out the check for his dues, he gave me $4 for the newspaper and told me to pick up a cow the next day. You know, I mean, we really have got an advantage. And I mean, I suppose maybe I have more over other women because of the newspaper and they, they really no, I really put my heart into it. I think your sincerity and your dedication, you have got to be the example first. But it is 
you can go out and do those things a hundred times easier than any man. If I took off tomorrow morning, if I didn't have this family home that, you know, still, I got three little boys, still depend on Ma. I got a married daughter in watching them this week for me, but if it wasn't that I had that obligation at home, I tell you, I know I could sign a hundred members a month. It's, it's just that easy right now. They are looking to us, and it's, we're their only salvation. And you women have got the greatest ability. I know you think, well, I can't do it. I never tried. Well, I never did either. And I feel sometimes like a professional con woman, you know. Uh, when I started out this newspaper, you know, I had to go out and hustle ads to pay for this darn thing. And I didn't even have a copy of what I was going to do. I went to these businesses. Everybody that we did a lot of business with, feed dealers, grocery store, drugstore, hardware, and I said, now I'm going to put out a paper about like this, and uh, I'm going to sell little ads about like that, and would you pay me $25 a year for one? And, you know, they couldn't hardly say no, especially if I owed them a bill. I told them I was going to take it off the bill. So it was kind of like blackmail, but a man probably couldn't get away with that. But I could get away with it, and any one of you gals here could do the same thing. So... I sold a pig in a poke. I got the money first and started the paper second because I was scared to death to start it first without any money. And uh, now most of those ads all come due in January, and I'll bill those people again January for their next year's ads. And just about all of them, now we have approximately 100 advertisers in there. Some buy bigger ads than others, but the majority of them buy the little standard size, which have gone up to $30 now because our postage and everything's gone up. Now, this is another thing. We've maintained our nonprofit permit, which has been a big salvation. It still costs me about $135, $40 a month. I forget what it is to mail the Freedom Press, but that's at uh, 2.7 cents. Now, if we were going at bulk, I think it's somewhere up around 8 cents right now and it would have killed us. We would have had to give it up. Now, somebody challenged it here about a year ago when we were really going full steam ahead, and they knew that newspaper was behind it. And I don't know if it was Farm Bureau, Dairy Lee, or who it was, but somebody challenged it and tried to take away our, our permit. And so happened the postmaster, Nyutica, listens to me on the radio all the time, and he says, that's the most nonprofit organization I ever heard of. <laughs> and he wouldn't let them get to first base. So, you know... It has been a tremendous advantage. I've had people write to me from other counties and states and say, how do you keep it? And, you know, I'm never even going to ask anybody or challenge it or give anyone instructions how because we got it and we're going to keep it. And I'm not going to go out and blow my horn all around telling people how or why, but we've got it. It has been a tremendous help, just like the newspaper has. Um, on raising money, I told Doris, I tell you what, one thing, and I've told this at other conventions, our county does, and many of you in the snow belt could do the same. We have a snowmobile meet once a year, usually in February, and we raise, last year we raised, I think, $1,300 through a snowmobile race, and I did the publicity on it, which is very, very important. You have to make sure you get out. We had more people at our snowmobile race than they did at the championship race, which was held about a week later. The United States Championship race is held in Boonville, and we had a bigger crowd at our little NFO race, and we made $1,300. So when they held um, one of these USSA-sanctioned races the week after, they thought that we had done such a great job, they asked us if we would uh, sell the food and take over the concessions at it. And we only made about $300 that week, and I knew the reason was that they hadn't done the publicity the way I had done it for our show. If I had done it for the USSA one, we probably would have made another $1,000 or so because we charge at the gate. Oh, I forget. We used to charge a dollar. Do we charge two now, hon? Do you remember? Dollar? We charge a dollar ahead for people to come in and watch it, and then they charge so much, you know, to enter the snowmobiles, and then they give the most of it back in uh, trophies and prizes of that. But uh, we make a fantastic amount of money just selling the food and by the head. You know, if you have like 800 people show up, that's $800, clean money. And uh, we have, we're fortunate, we have a member who has a big farm and he's active in the snowmobiling, his whole family is, and w we know how to do it. We've done it for about 10 years now. But it's an easy way to raise money. You work real hard and you freeze yourself for about one day, but it gives us a lot of money to do within our county when we get all done. Now, they, our county 
uh, offered anyone who wanted to come in as a voting delegate to the convention, they offered to give them $50 a piece to help offset their expenses. And we pay for radio shows when we have to and occasionally hold a sausage feed or a, a dinner where, you know, it's almost free or it is free. And it's really a big advantage. Now, I just don't want to drag on here and take up too much time because I know there's a lot of other gals here and I've got to get on to a, a dairy meeting. But um, I just can't emphasize enough. Doris has got these... Um, little pledge papers up here. I don't know if you all see them right up here towards the front. Hold, hold one of those up. Um, yeah, yeah, contact pledges. Now I know every one of you women sitting here, if you filled out one of those that you're going to contact five or ten people when you get home and get them to join NFO, I'm sure you would have maybe not a hundred percent luck, but you'd be surprised what you could do. I mean, I wouldn't even have begun to think I could have done such a thing. And like my husband says, we've got the advantage over the men. Most of us are fast talkers. <laughs> and, you know, I think women tend to be better organizers in the part that you kind of put things together, like most of us do the book work on the farm. I know that. And I kind of, you know, tend to put things together and how I'm going to make phone calls or I'll set up a a phone call system, have other people make calls for me. And I, I mean, you just can't pass up. Men should never overlook this, this ability that we have and stop us from doing it. And, and you should be really proud, you know, of yourself if you can get out and do something like that. Just don't pass it up. That's all I've got to say. Now, if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Yes. Well, I have an editorial page, which is, you know, a whole page long, like it's usually eight or nine typewritten sheets um, on just everything. And a lot of it, a lot of it, I, I remember getting criticized when I started it by our county president. He says it looks like the Maxwell family paper or something. But I got the people's confidence by telling them little tidbits that went on on our farm so that they knew I was a legitimate farm wife. And usually the first two or three paragraphs, you know, I went into something hilarious that happened to our family or, or all the disasters that we call it the perils of Pauline, you know, where everything, the sewers clogged up and the barn cleaner broke and this happened and that happened. Or one time I hadn't milked in a few months. It was wintertime. The cows were almost dry. And uh, one night all the kids went to a ball game and Dad and I stayed home to do the milking. And I went in the barn and all the milking machine units, we use these condies, they were broken and falling apart, and you had to glue this on and hold that on. And after milking about 10 cows, I said, how in the heck do you get through milking with these? He said, well, you know, you just have to take your time. And I said, my God, those aren't fit to milk anything. And the next morning, I piled them all in the car and went to the candy dealer and bought all new machines and come home with them, you know. Things like this really reach the farmer's wife's hearts just as much as they do the men because they know that uh, I'm one of them, you know. Uh, like one time, uh, my little boy came home from school with a black crayon in his pocket, and I was in a hurry, and I frisked the pockets and missed the crayon and put it through the wash and put it in the dryer with my underwear, and I come out with the prettiest black striped underwear you ever wanted to see, you know, and, it, and I soaked it and did everything to it, and it never did come out, you know. It was like tie-dyed underwear, and, you know, Things like this, little anecdotes I write about, but then after I get through the, the, the preliminaries right there, then I go into what we've been doing in, in the county and the state, what the cooperatives have been going through, and I have nailed those cooperatives to the point where, you know, our people really got worried at one time that they were afraid that, uh, they were afraid for my life. I mean, they really were. And I got to the point where they had me so worried if I heard something strange in the middle of the night, I really got a little scared. But I had exposed the cooperative uh, scandal, what was going on, how Derry Lee owed over $100 million. I got a Dun & Bradsheet report through my brother's business on them, and I knew what they owed, and their members had no idea, and I exposed it. And they were constantly cutting us up and underselling us in the market. And I knew that stuff had to hit the fan in a year or two, that they couldn't continue to underbid NFO and try to put us out of business. But I exposed it first, and everybody, you know, uh, said that's, that can't be true. It would have been out in the news. 
And within a matter of months, Dairy Lee came up with an $18 million assessment on its farmers, and they started scattering and leaving. And within a matter of another year, they had another $12 million assessment, and the next year about another $12 million, and they're going from bad to worse right now. And it, you know, I had seen it, and our people had felt it in the marketplace. And I report right what I see. The only way I get out of being sued for slander is I say it's my personal opinion. You know, if I said it's a fact, well, they could really, you know, say I'm slandering. But you know, I put from my observations, or it's my personal opinion that this is going on. And then. Uh, we write, I have another gal now the last couple of years when I ran for Congress, I had to take the editorship out of my name for a few months and she took the name, but I still did the work, you know, most of the work behind it. But she writes articles and she's one that delves in figures all the time. She studies the dairy record and we come up with facts when they tell us we have a, a surplus. We have presented articles in that newspaper that shows we haven't produced as much milk last year as we did in 1955 and we've got a lot more people drinking it, you know. And no one would believe us, but now all of a sudden, right at Chuck Frazier's meeting the other day, there was a proven fact that the CCC purchases are way, way down, some as low as, you know, like 50 or 75 percent lower than they were before. So we have exposed a lot of things, and I reprint things sometimes from the National Reporter or the National Rural Life Conference things, things that I feel that are important. And then I have New York State news, you know, things that are going on in the state. Um, I also m might mention here, and you know, I don't want to scare you off of getting this involved, but I was appointed to Governor Kerry's Ag Resources Commission, um, well, about a year ago now. I've been serving about a little over a year. And this has helped us tremendously because I sit with the people from Ag and Markets and EPA and DEC and all these commissions and equalization and assessment that are ruling us all the time. And when we run into a problem, I have at least made a friendship with these people, and I know who to call and where to go for help, and they've been very supportive of us. They haven't really thrown any stones in our way at all. And then about three months ago, a man came to the house from FHA and asked, I have no idea how it came about, but he said, would you serve on our FHA committee and approve loans, which I needed like a hole in the head. But I talked it over with Home Office and Chuck Frazier, and they said, you really should because you could maybe do a lot of good for our people. So I'm serving on the FHA. I have a lot of these non-paying jobs. I'm waiting for one that really pays good. I get uh, the Ag Resources Commission $75 every other month in my expenses. When I, We have a maid meeting every other month, once in a while something special. And uh, FHA, I think they're supposed to pay me $7 in the afternoon, but I haven't even received anything from it yet. But it has given me great insight. And I might mention right here, I know Devon got real angry. I had an FHA man at our state convention purposely to help our people who needed loans. And after he spoke and said, oh, we're doing so good, we're giving away more money than ever, just like it was you know, a money-earning proposition. And um, he went on and on how great it was that these farmers were getting all these loans. And Devon got up, and I could see, my husband was seething right along with him. Devon says, you know, it's great, you know, go ahead and get the loans, but there's no substitute for earned income. There's just no substitute for getting paid for your product. And, uh, you know, I kind of feel this way. And after I sat, you know, I always worry. I lay in bed at night and think, are we ever going to live long enough to pay off our mortgage? Well, let me tell you what those mortgages are. The average one runs about $200,000, and they're paying 8% interest now through FHA. There's very little of that 3% money left anymore. And most of them have about 50 milk cows. Now, that's something like $4,000 a cow. And years ago, they used to think it was great if it was $1,000 a cow on your mortgage. And if those farmers live to be 1,000, they will never more than pay interest if they... And you're going to have a real sad situation here. If this keeps going on, you're going to end up with the government owing, owning all these farms, like Kenton Bailey says, we're going to have chicken coop janitors, and that's all we're going to be. But we were given the criteria to pass these loans, if the farmer had a good track record, he worked hard, took good care of his animals, if he couldn't obtain credit anyplace else, if he had a decent looking place, and some of them aren't even decent looking, but anyways, the main thing was he had to be a farmer, he couldn't get credit anyplace else, and he had decent character and ability. And we're supposed to pass them. We have one man. And, you know, this is another little reason why I got into this, because 
I can't come out to the countryside and tell the farmer I approved your loan or disapproved it. Many of them don't even know that I'm on that committee. But um, I did it for a very devious reason, uh, reason also, because I see, you know, the facts are bared right out to me what those farmers owe. Here's his name, address, and I know 99% of the farmers in our area. And this is what he owes. And this one farmer's been in and out of NFO twice, and hell, he didn't need anything. He big shot, you know, all kinds of machinery. Well, he's got 77 milk cows, and he now owes $332,000 on about a 200-acre farm. And I'll tell you, if they sold him out tomorrow morning, there's no way he'll come up with two, more than $200,000, never mind 332. And I'm just waiting one of these days to have one of these guys blow off at me that, you know, we don't need NFO, we're doing it. And it's going, I'm going to really have to bite my tongue not to say, I, Mr., I know just what you got back there. You know, like Orrin Lee said last night, we got to be calm about it, you know, and we don't want to. But I have had the notion so many times at these FHA meetings to say, loan those damn fools another $75 and let's get the show on the road, you know. But um, every once in a while, the FHA people say to me, oh, is that one of your members there, you know? But it's, it's been a tremendous education to me. If I had gone to college for 10 years, I would never have learned what I've learned in NFO the last few years. And I mean, it's just something right along with, with the whole bit that I wanted to see the workings of this FHA and how it was going along. And I mean, it's, it's scary. I'll tell you, it's scary. I, I just can't imagine what's going to happen to farmers. If they weren't propping us up with those damn loans, we'd have had a depression last year that would have made the last one look like a Sunday school picnic, and you all know it. Okay, any other questions? I got <laughs> Yes. Yes, um, you know, we ask for a $2 donation, but a lot of those hard-headed ones, I send it to them anyways, whether they send the money or not. And believe it or not, I've had about two a year write to me and say, take me off your mailing list, you know. But um, if you um, leave your name and address someplace here up there where they're registering, I'll stop by this afternoon at 1 o'clock and pick them up. Yes. No, I have never really been chewed out. In fact, um, I usually, uh, now I got to tell you this, I'm, I'm not really a woman's liber to the point that I like to, I don't want to go to the men's room or anything like that, you know. And uh, I mean, and I don't like to go visit farmers on my own. If I go with my husband or if I go with a county president or a neighbor in the neighborhood, I really feel much more secure. I really don't feel like, a woman should go into these farms, but only the ones I really know well that I do. I feel very uneasy, but I go in with somebody who knows the farmer usually and will introduce me, and then I do my thing. But I can remember one time being with our county president, and he's a great big guy and real outspoken when he wants to be. And we got to this place, and uh, he's, he said, uh, the man's name was Doug Elliott, and he said, uh, we're here from NFO, and we you know, think we ought to join or something. Doug said, what in the hell's NFO done for us anyways? Why should I join that organization? And Herb, it just struck him right. He usually isn't like this. And he says, well, what in the hell have you done? And he used a few more choice words about the dog running around manure spreader and doing something. And he said, what have you done anyways? And the two of them, their faces turned purple. I thought of a couple bandy roosters, you know, and I kicked Herb. I said, I think we ought to go. And the guy was sitting in a truck while we were talking. We were standing on the ground. And, and the, oh, I really thought, you know, we were going to get face down. So I said, sir, come on, come on, we, uh, we're in a hurry, we better go. So we got out of there. And when I got home that night, there was a phone call from a neighbor of this man. And he said, um, I'd really like to know more about NFO. Would you send Anita back alone? And I went back the next time with a fellow who was working field staff in our area. And, uh, well, he made a joke. He said, I told you to come alone, you know. But he joined right then. But personally, no, that's the only time I've ever seen a little confrontation. It wasn't at me, it was at Herb. But uh, they have never really attacked me. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I've had, you know, the cold shoulder. You know, you feel the ice dripping right off it. But never really, never really, uh, you know, that's it, get, get out. And, and I have gone to places where they've warned me the devil himself wouldn't go. And I've come right out with the money in my hand with no sweat at all, you know, really. It's awfully hard sometimes not to argue with people when they bring up some of these older things. But I think if we can remember that never is a long time, and 
arguing with them at this stage of the game won't gain anybody any good. Uh, perhaps the people who have joined and then dropped out or those who never have joined uh, have felt that it wasn't right for them to join at one time or another. Maybe they had animosity toward a neighbor or an officer or something like that. And we as members sometimes perhaps haven't done as good a job explaining ourselves as maybe we could have. And if we take it from the standpoint that we are all in the same boat as producers and we need to be working together regardless of what may have happened in the past, the producers that are left cannot afford the luxury of arguing among themselves and I think the time is long past for us to take issue with farm organizations as such just because they're other farm organizations. I think if we can remember that each organization was set up for some specific purpose and that you can't get apples off an orange tree, if we can explain to people that we have the only collective bargaining organization and fully, freely admit that these other organizations have their services and abilities, but don't expect them to do what they are not set up to do. NFO is not going to sell insurance or tires or gas or feed or, you know, those kinds of things, and those are services. So if they want to belong to organizations that provide that service, but just make them aware that if they want price, then they have to deal with an organization that is set up to do something about price. Now these other organizations, by and large, if you want to chisel a few cents off of your input costs, by all means take advantage if you can. But getting your inputs at a reduced price, perhaps through a um, volume buying, most of them feel that they can do that service, is far different than trying to get a price for us. Now, the co-ops have done a job in the past. When they were first set up years ago, there was not nearly as much organized buying as there is now. And no doubt, the co-ops had done a service for the people at one time or another. Now, they're still performing a service by taking the production off your hands. But if you stop and think about it, most of the cooperative marketing situations are not much different than individual farmers. Now, each farmer sells in competition with the next guy. They are selling into a structure where there are maybe a half a dozen buyers, sellers, users, handlers ultimately of any given commodity and the co-ops that are handling are selling also into that structure and you've seen many times where these facilities whether they're independent or co-op when they go to fill a large order for a grain company for instance then the guy who will bid the lowest is the one who cleans out their storage, right? So even a large string like GTA that was prevalent in the area where we used to farm, uh, they are not able to bargain. Now they can market, but they don't bargain, and there's a tremendous difference between marketing and bargaining. Now the NFO in many areas is also marketing, because the volume isn't large enough to actually bargain. But while we are building a bargaining structure, we are able to do as well at marketing. And marketing is not what we were set up to do. All of us who have been in the organization, whether it's five months or five years or 20 years, we did not set out to build a better marketing organization. We are building a bargaining group. So if you can make people understand the difference between what it is we are and what we are trying to do. I don't think we need to argue then about which organization is better than another or which has fallen down on what particular issue. If we will take a look at what we can do and what they can do, I believe that we can eliminate 
some of the uh, hard language that has sometimes passed between people. And as Mr. Staley has said and Devon said yesterday, and I'm sure most of the leaders that you hear nowadays, we're talking in terms of recruiting a younger... Please turn the tape over to side number two.